And I understand Monday Night Raw aired last night. Oh, boy. And I understand I watched some of it, and I have no memory of any of it. I have no memory of any of it. And I la- explain it like you explained it to me. So, Jim, I watched Raw last night. I went to sleep about 1030. So I saw the first two and a half hours. But when I woke up, I can't remember anything that happened. That's the way you said it to me. But it will probably come back to me when you start talking about it as well. Yeah, well, I ain't going to go into too much detail. Uh, Again, boy, howdy. This is a three-hour program that could be, the meat of the matter could be condensed into 15 minutes, and you wouldn't miss anything. And a couple of things I watched under false pretenses. If you may recall, the first segment was Ms. TV. And normally I skip Ms. TV, but they opened up, there's Paul E., Paul Heyman already sitting in the ring for Ms. TV. So I said, I'm going to watch Ms. TV for Paul Heyman, right? Anything, any of this coming back to you? Do you remember Paul's jowls being out there? I do remember now this segment, and I can also see you saying, you know, oh, I want to watch Paul E. chew up the scenery, yes. Well, he didn't get a chance to take a bite. Because Paulie, he introduced himself, and they got with that. He, Paul's becoming a baby face because they just love to say his name and shit on the introduction. But then Miz did a long monologue about money in the bank and the cash-in process like he's done twice and put himself over endlessly. And I just jotted down, will Paulie ever get to speak? And that's when Miz pitches to him with, The winner of the Money in the Bank will cash in on Roman Reigns, and Paul says, and they will fail. And then Paulie took over, and he did. For him, this was nothing. For anybody else, it had been a great piece of business, but for him, is you lackluster because he didn't get very long, and he, but he has the great facials and the reactions and the delivery, but as soon as he said a few things, and talking about Roman Reigns, here comes riddle music. And I'm, oh, Christ. Here come Goof comes out and does goof shit and calls Paul a horse's ass. Um, Miz was pissed at the interruption of the, the, the show there. I was pissed that we didn't get to hear more of Paul. And instead, why couldn't Riddle have come out and interrupted Miz? Have you noticed, Heyman reminds me of John Taffer. What? Have you noticed that? Why? Because of the hair dye? Well, no. <laughs> actually, yeah, Paul's hair was not that fucking midnight black when he was 23 <laughs> years old. Our lightning bugs are following him around in the daytime with hair that dark. It's ins- I mean, you you could fall into his hair and disappear. It's got its own gravitational pull. It's so black. Uh, but <clears throat> he reminds me of John Taffer because he gets that that smile on his face when he's browbeating somebody and dressing them down. You don't want to look bad in front of your whole family, do you now? (laughs) But anyway, so this Friday night, it's going to be Riddle against Roman Reigns on SmackDown. Either they're setting up for something good to happen with somebody else with Roman Reigns, or this is a, a program we're going to have to watch. Between Riddle and Roman? I think so. I think Riddle's one of the guys that they seem to really like. A lot of guys are out. They don't have a lot of inventory right now. (laughs) So you kind of have to go with what you have. And he is over with the fans there. I mean, we don't really like his goofiness, but the fans like him. And out of all the people there, what are your other options? Do something with one of the New Day members again? Ooh, he may be right. (laughs) One of the guys that... There's a guy named Adam Revolver, worked for OVW for a long time. When I went back briefly about 10 years ago, um, Danny Davis asked me, please come and try to just help this show, right? He was in a bad spot at that particular point. And I came in and I watched the first show, and Adam Revolver said to me, I was explaining that I was like, what the fuck can we do with this? And he said, well... You don't go to war with the army you want. You go to war with the army you have. I said, in that case, point me toward the white flag. (laughs) 
Anyway, Riddle fired up a little bit. Of what, what? It wasn't that. Fun. Well, how did he react to that? I mean, just no one's no one gets that line thrown back in their face when they say that. He got kind of he got kind of used to me after a while. I, you know. Anyway, <laughs> Riddle fired up on the promo. If everything about him, from his the way he speaks to the way he dresses to the the mannerisms that he has to the giraffes and unicorns flying out of his ass. Everything is so goofy. He's got some oomph. This is the first time I actually heard him speak like he was pissed off about something. He might be, and I know he was a shoot fighter, so he might be believable if he didn't have this persona. I assume that they didn't give him this persona on purpose because who would have ever thought of this and why would you do it on purpose if you did? So this must be him. But if he wasn't such a goddamn goof, I can see where you might have something. But basically, the stipulation is on Friday night on SmackDown, at least they're crossing over now. Can you imagine if they weren't putting some of these people on both shows, how much we would see of some of them? The stipulation is if he wins, he's the champion. But if he loses, he'll never get another title shot. So I'm hoping for a quick defeat of Riddle on Friday. And then Paul says, and let me introduce you to the Usos. And here come the Usos. But here come the Street Profits. What a shock. The only other team on the whole show that we see every week. But instead of interacting with Riddle, so out of this, Riddle didn't take advantage of being in the ring with the manager who was unprotected and do anything to Paul because Paul can't take a fucking bump anyway. My God, can you imagine if he if he busted open the the fucking saturated fat content right. alone would kill... All right, will you stop it? If he busted open, that's what's going to happen if he takes a bump? If he's he gonna... took a bump and busted <laughs> open and all the fucking saturated fat and monosodium glutamate came out and sprayed all over everybody? I guess WWE's next step would be like a Troma Films kind of run there. <laughs> and then the Usos can't beat up Riddle because the Street Profits come down and they got to, so they had a single match with one of the Usos against Montez Ford and just nothing happened with Riddle after the stipulation was announced. And, and we got to, after that match, that was the first 30 minutes of the show. So, and that's kind of where I started checking out. I hate to say it, but the Street Profits, as soon as they come out, I feel like I've seen whatever this is going to be. I've seen it yeah. every week. We've seen one versus the other and the other one versus the other one and both of them versus both of them and back and forth. Um, the One of the, be the best thing of the first hour of the show was probably the uh, Cody package of the gutsy performance, everybody putting him over, and then the recap of Seth Franklin Rollins jumping him and beating the piss out of him with sledgehammer last week. That was great. And again, they're, if they can keep doing this, they're going to keep Cody over and keep him in people's minds. But then Seth Franklin did a sit down backstage. Who is the stagey British announcer? That's uh, Nigel. That's not Nigel McGinnis. No, not Nigel McGinnis, but Nigel or Simon or Oliver. I forget what his name is. Well, whatever it is, he has the 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 emotion of a fucking chair leg. I mean, it just he says these stilted the accent sounds nice. You always sound like you're a little smarter if you got the British accent, but it's just without any emotion. So Seth has no remorse because Cody is a virus plaguing the WWE since WrestleMania. Boy, I wish every pandemic only lasted two months. You got to make unpopular decisions, Seth says. Take matters in your own hands. Some writer worked really hard on whatever it was that Seth was saying. Did you, do, do you remember when wrestling was fun to watch and you understood what people were saying and doing? It was straight. They weren't talking in circles. They weren't trying to be dramatic with flowery prose. And it, and you, you mean actually, before scripts? Uh, yes, I remember. Yes, and you actually understood what the fuck that they was talking about, what they were bumping their gums about. Did you understand what? Well, no, you were asleep by this point. 
Well, no, I was I was still watching by this point, but you got to remember, my attitude is Seth Rollins is on PCP. That's the gimmick. He could say anything, he could do anything. It all fits in with the gimmick. Well, it's Seth versus AJ Styles tonight, and the winner goes into the Money in the Bank match. It's a qualifier, but at that point, Seth looked at his sledgehammer and laughed uproariously, and AJ Styles came in and just kicked him over backwards in his chair and knocked him on his ass. So that passes for an angle these days. Uh, did you watch Becky versus Dana Brooke? I did watch that because I really like Becky Lynch and I wanted to see what they're going to do. And usually she's one of the few highlights of the show. So I did watch. Well, I didn't watch most of this because of Dana Brooke. Because on one hand, you have Becky Lynch, great heel, great worker, great promo. On the other hand, you have Dana Brooke of the 24-7 title nonsense and the plastic surgery that makes her look like a duck-billed platypus. And so I declined to pay too much attention to this. But basically, as, as she should have, Becky beat the shit out of her in very quick fashion. But then Oscar came out and beat up Becky with the erratic puke induce camera work where is zooming and panning and jerking and things and the way that this finished up was oscar hit becky lynch with six of her kung fu strikes and kicks without becky lynch being able to take one bump or even register anything at 100 miles an hour and then germander and becky powdered to the entrance and then Alexa Bliss just comes out right past her, waves at her, and gets in the ring, and Oscar steps out and leaves, and we have a girls' tag match involving other fucking people. What, did, so did they want to get heat on Becky by having her beat up Dana? Or did they want to get Oscar over by having her beat up Becky? Or why the fuck once that they had started that fight. Did they just have other girls walk in between them and the whole thing? Everybody just left that had been previously fighting. Oh, I, my fight's over. I'll just walk away now. What fuck happened there? Everything just ends abruptly in WWE in a weird way. Like they go to commercials without saying it. It's a very passive aggressive way. This segment ended in a weird passive aggressive way. Music hit. <laughs> someone else just walked by and they just went to the next thing. It makes no sense. The show is formatted horribly. It's a horrible show. It's a really, really, really bad show. AEW doesn't put you to sleep like this show does. Well, and, you know, somebody's going to clip you saying that and, and say you're talking about us. Anyway, um, Alexa Bliss and Liv Morgan took on Dewdrop and Nikki Ass. Hey, let me trend on Twitter again real quick. Liv Morgan is too girly. There, I've done it again. The Foo Foo Blondes won this one. They had a package on the Judgment Day where they turned on Edge. And have you already seen when they stand there and speak now without Edge, Finn Balor sounds like an Irish Richie Cunningham. And there's no... <laughs> it was an Irish O.P. Taylor the other day, so I'm glad that he's gotten older. He's growing up a little bit. <laughs> He stays, he's lost Fonzie, though. He's lost without the Fonz. Um, Kevin Owens wrestled uh, Elikiel in a single match. Whenever they reveal why that this guy is going to this trouble, I'm going to watch that to make fun of the reason. But otherwise, no, I'm not watching this fucking match. It took up 20 minutes of TV time. Next week, And the finish... Well, wait a minute. I'm going to... The finish of this match was... Owens losing because he got mad at the announcers calling the guy Ezekiel instead of Elias and stood there yelling at him and got counted out. And then Owens just storms off. Mad. So Ezekiel gets a microphone and talks to all of his Zeke freaks out there. What the... F this is written for the mental age of six and he uh, Elikiel says that Elias will be on Raw next week it'll be a special guest and Owens loses his mind because no it's you it's you it's a 
So how are they going to do this? Are they going to do a split screen like Cactus Jack and Dude Love next week? How are they going to give the guy the beard that he shaved off? It'll be obviously phony, won't it? Yeah, I don't know how they're going to do it, but let's give credit where credit is due. Kevin Owens, a genius. This guy figured <laughs> out how to get millions without tearing your pecs. You know, that's true. He's, he's never been in anything more insignificant after he got the biggest raise of his life. Yeah, every week he's acting like a goof. He's gotten sillier and sillier than ever before after he got all that money. He's very smart. I think he's doing it the right way. Well, uh, continuing on this program, John Cena visited a... Now, it, was I correct in saying this was a Ukrainian special needs kid, but he went to the Netherlands to see because the kid's family are refugees? I believe Is so, this, yeah. Okay, so John Cena didn't just go to Poughkeepsie. He didn't just drop by on his way to the arena in the town that he heard the kid. He went to the fucking Netherlands. We need more John Cena's. Seriously, um, no matter what anyone wants to say about his wrestling or his stupid mistake with China a few years ago in Taiwan, whatever that was, but he seems like maybe the greatest human being ever to be around wrestling. Yeah. The fact that he's done all these make-a-wishes, he's still doing it, he put on his whole outfit, and he flew over there to do it. Of course, there was a camera crew, but either way, he's doing these things. Well, but th that's why I said the camera crew would be great if you were in Poughkeepsie or fucking Dayton. But there's more motivating you than... <laughs> if I was going to go to the Netherlands to meet somebody on purpose and spend the afternoon with them, I'd take a camera crew. Hey, did you see in the news the other day that The Rock gave his mom a new house? Yes, I did. I saw that. Did you immediately laugh about the fact that we always talk on the show I about just, it? He always has a camera crew with him for all these deals. And here's the camera and mom. Go. <laughs> but also, you know, it would have been great because he said he had his whole design team, everything inside the house. It was completely furnished down to knickknacks and everything was brand new. It'd have been great if she walked in and said, whose shit is this? Where's my shit? <laughs> <laughs> what have you where's, done to my stuff? Where's, where's your grandfather Peter's fucking shells from the beach? And Anyway, MVP cut a promo on Cedric Alexander because he interfered at Hell in a Cell and Cedric won't stay out of their business, so MVP had to wrestle a singles match against Cedric Alexander. And now they've got the managers wrestling because the manager is a better worker than the guy that he's managing. And Cedric had a flurry and almost distracted him. And MVP took over and hit his finish. Boom, one, two, three, in about 90 seconds. This would have been a squash match under any circumstances. But when the manager beats you in 90 seconds, are they trying to tell Cedric something? I don't know. I was surprised by this whole thing, actually. I've been surprised that they brought Cedric back for this role. It's been several weeks now. And then his music hit, and this happened. But they brought him back just to make fun of him, not nobody wanting him to help them. And everything he does backfires. Yeah, that's exactly right. <sighs> and this All is a way right. that, I guess this is a way you have almost an MVP do something that ties into something without Lashley being involved. Oh, we're going to get to him in a minute. The qualifying match finally came up for the Money in the Bank extravaganza with AJ and Seth. And, you know, I hate to say it. this These guys, again, two great professionals. They're going to have a great ma match, a great TV match, or a pay-per-view match. Whatever you ask them to do, they can both work. They're both incredible athletes. They're not going to do anything stupid. They're not going to hurt themselves or anybody else. It's going to be exciting. But it, it, on this program, in this company, it just seems it took 10 minutes to get into it, obviously, on this show. But it it seems like I've seen this all 100 times. All the matches look and sound the same. The announcers sound the same. The building looks the same. Both guys, these guys or anybody else that I've just described that fits these parameters, work their asses off, and it all looks good, but there's no life in it. There's no credibility. There's no energy and excitement because the booking, the the storyline, if you want to use that word, the angles, the 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 reason why these people are interacting, none of it matters. It's all so blah and so same and so... Eh. 
So you got these two guys having a great match on a program with no life that we don't mostly care about. And that's a shame for them. But finally, Seth Rollins hit the buckle bomb and missed a frog splash, and AJ went for the Clash of Styles, and Seth fucking foiled that and turned it into a top spread one, two, three. So now, <laughs> at least he's back in the win column after he dropped three in a row to Cody. Now they've, they're going to have to sacrifice AJ and other people that have uh, they've already been beaten like drums to give Seth some wins so that he... And what's he going to do next? Again, they had the perfect fucking deal. Cody and Seth shook hands. Seth could have said, I earned respect for you, which he did in that match. And they could have shook hands, and then instead of attacking him with a sledgehammer, somebody else could have attacked him, and he could have got in the thing to fucking fight for Cody's honor, whatever. But instead, you got, he's a heel again, and now they're starting him from scratch. Maybe he'll beat some more people. And he still lost those three matches to Cody. The way you just laid out, it would have made a little more sense. Okay, he lost those three matches. He didn't win anything, but now he's a different guy. Now he sees He learned something, and he changed his attitude, and those three losses were the best thing that ever happened to him because now he won't lose again. But that would have been too easy. Until Cody's champion in a year, and then you could build up to another match between the two. And then who's the guy that carried your... Your banner, who's the guy that got even with so-and-so? Who's the guy that did this in your absence? I was carrying the ball and carrying the company. And I did it after the matches with you because you made me say, but now you want to come and take my spot and you go all over, the whole thing over again. Speaking of the whole thing over again, Riddle versus Champa. So now... Tommaso Ciampa, formerly bright spot of NXT, will now be a middle card guy that puts goofs over that they use in the main events, but never does anything on his own because elsewise he would get over because he's a great worker. And in three minutes, Riddle wins with an RKO 1-2-3, and the announcers say, easy win for Riddle. So now we know... Thanks for coming, Tommaso. We really enjoyed you when they used you. At one point in this match, Riddle came off the top with, I think the announcers called it the floating bro, but it's one of those goofy flips where they climb up on the top rope, turn their back on the ring and their opponent, jump off, flipping backwards and somersaulting, and he landed full-fledged across both of Tommaso's knees with Riddle's upper cannonballed, basically a flying cannonball off the top across both of Tommaso's legs in the middle. A guy, and I'm talking about on top of the kneecaps, not the other way, on the backs, but on the tops, like you don't want somebody to land on your legs. Tommaso's already had at least one major ACL knee reconstruction that I'm aware of. So this fucking goof decides to cannonball him off the top rope and land on both of his legs. And Tommaso sold it, which I don't know if he was selling it because he was selling or whether he sold it because he's like, I can't believe you just did that. Anyway, do you remember any of that? I did watch that, and I was pretty horrified for Tommaso because he sold it right away. When he got up and took the next thing, that's when I was like, okay, maybe it's not as bad as I thought, or maybe he's just a trooper, but it looked really bad. It looked really bad. I mean, he landed right on his knee. <laughs> so Bianca, Bianca Belair was in the ring for a promo and she said, whatever, and I didn't pay attention. Rhea Ripley popped up on the screen and that's when I started paying attention. But there she is with Finn Balor and Damian Priest. And I mentioned Finn started, Rhea started, Finn did a smidgen of talking. Priest did most of it. Thank goodness at least his voice has some element of bass in it. Sounds like a man. But they're going to miss Edge real bad. And then Ripley promoted Bianca and the money in the back. She delivers the scripted material, but she delivers it well. 
I'd like to see, you know, extended versions of what she can do on her own without people telling her what to say, but she does the prepared verbiage better than most of the other girls. And But then she said the shit, and <laughs> Bianca Belair, the babyface in the ring, just stands there and looks at her, and they just go to the next thing. No answer. Uh, again, it's like... It's like the Three Stooges with either Joe Besser or Joe Dorita. It's just like, fuck, there was something there, but it's the wrong combination. They needed some edge. And then... Where's it filmed? Is there a spooky corridor in the building? Are they in the yeah. same dimension that the House of Black is in? Have we not even taken that into account? Well, I think they're they're in the same dimension until they they every once in a while they bop over to the fifth dimension, but that's only for up, up and away in my beautiful balloon or Stone Soul Picnic. I'd like to see the cameraman from the Judgment Day segments have a conversation with the cameraman from the House of Black segments. <laughs> Find out what their experiences you, are like. Can you imagine if if but if the cameraman from the Judgment Day came in and told the cameraman from the House of Black, look. Here's what you've been trying to do, and here's how you get there. That would be great. Anyway, Theory did a promo in the back. I like Theory's glib nature and animated uh, uh, delivery, but he was hampered by the ridiculous rule of not looking at the camera that's one foot from your face while you're backstage, and that's the only thing you could possibly see. And they also made him say the phrase championship opportunity. But otherwise, it was it was all right for what it was. It's about the... We'll get to the main event in a second. At least you missed that. You know, the thing I don't get is if you're going to script it, even if you're going to do it, if you're going to insist on that, the way promos effectively work is for the guy to talk through the camera so that people at home feel like there's a connection. He's talking about someone or he's talking to me. Why doesn't Vince accept that? Why is that one of the Vince things that he hates? To where people have to look up at things that are not flying in the sky and look over this way at where there's nobody instead of just talking right to the people at home or from to their the opponent. I, from the time I got into business and started learning how to do promos and being taught how to do promos, people giving me suggestions, whatever, I always heard, if, if, yes, if someone is interviewing you and you're in a live situation with an audience, you look at recognize, respond to, give an aside to the announcer. He's the guy you're talking to. But you also look at the fans in the arena. And you also, uh, uh, more importantly, if you really want to make a point to the nemesis that you're speaking to, that you're going to be fighting in whatever match coming up, you look at the camera and you make eye contact because you're telling that guy that you're fighting. But what you're also doing is you're telling the fans at home, and when they can look in your eyes and see if you look like you mean what you're saying and you're not blinking and you're not shifty-eyed and you're not searching in yourself for something to say or trying to remember something, when you're burning a hole in that camera lens with your eyes and your meaning with the inflection and the force in your voice, everything that you say, that makes people believe you. Never anywhere. Have I heard a promoter, booker, or anybody else don't look at the camera until Vince McMahon? Much like medical facility, box-like structure, championship <laughs> opportunity. I forgot about that one, box-like structure. Yeah, there are, he, he started this when I was up there. In the late 90s, he would go out, oh, it, it looks fake or it doesn't look real when they're just looking at the camera. Tell them not to look at the camera. On a pre-tape, there's, there's an interviewer and an empty room. And so that's why everybody would acknowledge the interviewer and then look at the camera. But since he started saying that, and it was like everything else, he would, you would say, well, not why, but what do you mean by this? Or what, you know, you would ask more detail. And he would tell you in a way that to him made perfect sense. And you still, when he was finished, wouldn't under, what, what are you seeing? 
that I'm not said that nobody else is seeing that it looks better to you and more real to you. And especially when, when Vince would say, well, so-and-so is more real or more natural. And this is the biggest bunch of contrived, phony, choreographed, clusterfuck shit that you're in the middle of. You know how phony some of the WWF stuff is and was. And as this is what you're worried about, it doesn't look real. But it, that's that's his thing. And now they all do it. And it looks odd as fuck. Sometime in the ring, he on the live interviews, he wouldn't want you to look at, and at least you got more to look at when you're in an arena with people on four sides of you. But I've said before, the handheld camera in the ring would be so close in front of me that I'd have to get on tiptoes and peek over it to look at the people. But as we still weren't supposed to look at it. But I'd look at it every once in a while. Well, obviously, there was people more. People believed me. That's right. People believed you. They still believe you. And I believe there was more to Raw after this theory promo, I just realized. Yes, there was. That's the theory. <laughs> and it hadn't been proven yet, but... <laughs> Chad Gable wrestled Muhammad Ali or Mustafa Ali or whatever. Beer Mayhan took on Rey Mysterio. Again, there is no answer to whatever the Mysterios have done. He beat the shit out of Rey. Rey got a flurry, got shut down again. Old Beer missed a shoulder to the post and went to the floor, turned around and just wiped Dominic out, just turned him into a grease spot, got back in the ring, stopped Ray, got the camel clutch, and got the tap out. Complete squash match of Ray Mysterio. There goes the Hispanic audience. Are you ready for the main event by now, Brian, or do you, do you wish that you had stayed awake and cognizant longer so that you would have some type of evidence if you intended to go to court to sue over a waste of your time for having to watch this program. I was absolutely sleeping by this point in time, and actually I was thinking more about the idea of going to court to prevent someone who is not the host of this show from transitioning to sponsors. Well, in that case, I know exactly the person you ought to call. Call Steven P. Show or two. Still to the rest. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, whether you've been watching a bad television program and you need some relief, or whether you've been wrongfully terminated from your employment and you need some recourse to pursue legal action, or let's say perhaps you've been injured in a car accident by a, a driver who may or may not have been impaired at the time. Let's say, for example, you live somewhere down, down the road from a pig farm. And at the pig farm, to make the pigs weigh more, they're feeding them radioactive waste, which when those pigs are slaughtered and made into bacon and you eat the bacon for breakfast, well, it caused your dick to fall off and your wife's uterus to fall out. And daggum, now you're dragging a uterus what? and a dick down the street. What? And you don't want to you don't want to cut the cord, but you're afraid that oh, what? you need those parts. Whether you've been damaged or <laughs> a friend or family member has been damaged or wrongfully terminated or poisoned or in some way infringed upon their God-given rights to be free Americans in this society, look no further for recourse. If your back is to the wall, then the man who will bust that wall down and put you flat on your back in a soft mattress with a big bank account. I'm talking about Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. Even if you do take over the program from your host and do transitions that are unauthorized in nature, Stephen P. New is worth it. He's a man that will bring justice to the most unjust situations. He will bring cash to the cashless. He will bring money to the moneyless, and he will bring shit to the shitheads 
that caused you to be in that situation to begin with. Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. Can you imagine all the... We've talked about Heyman being the voice of the homeless. Well, Stephen P. New can be the 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 shitter of the shitterlessness or whatever I was going for there. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, maybe. There's always a chance, but I don't know what you were going for. If that I don't work. know what I was going for anyway. Stephen P. New. <laughs> Newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. I just had to throw that in there. Because it seemed like we were running out of program. Well, we're not running out of program, and Raw didn't run out of program because you still haven't told me what the main event was. I forgot. Oh, well, was there sleeping. was no main event. Oh. There was no main event because <laughs> the main event slot was taken up by a pose down. A pose down between Austin Theory and Bobby Lashley. I'm not shitting you. They actually plugged this later on. Somehow, there was no reason for this. Theory asked for it. So that's like me asking for a pose down against Luger in his prime. Theory's in shape, but he ain't Lashley, right? They did Again, either they just needed something with Lashley, some reason to advertise his name. They had no other match. They saved it till the end at 10.48 p.m. Eastern. Theory starts his entrance. They go to the break. They do a three and a half minute break. They come back and Adam Pierce is in the ring with Theory and he introduces Lashley. And by the time Adam Pierce is starting the rules for the pose down, it's five minutes to 11 Eastern. So then they had to rush through this thing. It was like Theory had the... Um, the wireless mic like you wear around your head like Madonna in the concerts, right? So he can speak even though his hands are occupied. And But he never got a chance to say anything. He started to say, whoa, whoa, to Pierce. Wait a minute. He wanted to tell Pierce something. Pierce said, shut up. Get to posing. Because <laughs> they got like three minutes left. So Or, he'll, or you'll be disqualified. Get on the podium or you'll be disqualified is what he said. So then Theory gets up there and does three poses, double bicep, side chest, most muscular. And I'm thinking, where did this come from? Why are they doing this? There's no reason. And then Lashley gets up, does the three poses, and it's audience participation voting. So shockingly, he wins. Even though Theory had the wireless microphone on, that's the one that he got on there and told people, cheer me. And they don't. And then he... and then. Who won, me or Lashley? And they cheered Lashley like crazy. So Theory says, one more pose. <laughs> and then pulls a thing of baby oil out from behind the... What's he got, the U.S. title or the Intercontinental title? Which one is it? U.S. title. U.S. title. Say, boy, there should tell him something right now. Which title does he have again? Gunther uh, has the other one. Yeah, well, he's got the U.S. title. He has a thing of baby oil. He squirts Lashley in the eyes, and Lashley sells it like carbolic acid in his pupils. And Theory hits a drop kick, and Lashley takes a bump out on the floor, and then people come to give Lashley a towel for his eyes, and Theory takes selfies in the ring, and that was it. And that was it. And they don't think they've given up. That's the saddest thing about what this show is. <laughs> They don't think that's how this comes across. You mean to tell me that they said, point me to the white flag when they saw the army they were about to march into war with? I know they don't have a giant roster, which is amazing considering all the wrestlers they fired over the last few years. But I was about to say they fired two territories worth of guys in the last year. And didn't we at one point still say they had a hundred and something left? Where'd they all go? That's a good question, but that was Monday Night Raw for a very raw Monday, as it mm. were. Jim, one or two more questions before we wrap things up. Very well. 